Perhaps the world's smallest and most elusive combat aircraft, the Jump Jet Harrier is unique. If there should ever be a war between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, one can take it for granted that all NATO airfields would be wiped off the map within 24 hours, and probably within 24 minutes. NATO would be left with no land-based air power whatsoever, except for a handful of Harriers, which can be dispersed to hide and fight. Many people, ignoring this rather important fact, have poured scorn on the little airplane. Their numbers sharply diminished after the Falklands campaign, when Harrier and Sea Harriers flew fighter and attack missions in weather that would have grounded every other fast jet in the world. It's now almost 30 years since the Harrier's little Hawker predecessor first got daylight under its wheels. Since then, the Harrier family has come a very long way indeed, and the story is still being written. Some 35 years ago, the press called this strange contraption the flying bedstead, and it was generally regarded as a kind of joke. But in fact, the principle of rising vertically from the ground on the thrust of a jet engine meant that eventually high-speed aircraft could be built that could operate without an airfield. In other words, they would survive in a war. By 1955, two short SC-1s were being built in Belfast, each fitted with five RB-108 turbojets. Four were arranged amidships, pointing down to provide lift. The fifth one was in the tail to provide thrust in the normal way. With Chief Test Pilot Tom Brooks Smith in the cockpit, the throttles of the four lift jets were opened up. The SC-1 lifted vertically off the ground and could then be controlled in hovering flight by compressed air jets at wingtips, nose, and tail. By opening the throttle of the engine in the tail, the SC-1 could be made to accelerate forwards. As speed increased, so did the lift of the wings, until the four lift jets could be shut down. This was called an accelerating transition. At the end of the flight, a decelerating transition had to be made back to engine-supported hovering flight, followed by a vertical landing. It was the age of VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. In California, the USAF and Ryan were experimenting with a much simpler VTOL, though one that demanded great piloting skill. Powered by a British Rolls-Royce engine, the X-13 VertiJet could race down a runway like other jets, or it could stand on its tail for veto. With its stubby fuselage tilted up at 90 degrees, it rode on its jet and could move up or down according to the pilot's extremely cautious and accurate juggling with the throttle lever. As in the bedstead and SC-1, compressed air jets were used to control the way it hovered. Its airfield was a huge flatbed vehicle called the Ground Service Trailer, whose large platform was raised by hydraulic rams into the vertical. The Delta Wing VertiJet would take off from or return to the trailer, just like a moth landing on a wall. Accelerating and decelerating transitions were made to and from wingborne or jetborne flight. Thanks to the nerve and piloting ability of Pete Girard, the test pilot, the VertiJet could put on an impressive show. But unless it could have been linked with computerized blind landing systems, it was impractical for an Air Force. It was, however, the Europeans who pioneered military VTOL because, being nearer to a potential attacker, they saw that jet lift could enable their aircraft to escape from their highly vulnerable airfields. West Germany built the VAC 191B. This had a central lift cruise engine with nozzles that could point to the rear or downwards, plus single lift jets in the front and rear fuselage. These lift jets were derived from those of the SC-1 and were used only during takeoff and landing. A totally different German prototype was the VJ-101. This had six Rolls-Royce turbojets. Two were mounted vertically in the fuselage and used only for VTOL. 
The other four were in pods, pivoting on the wingtips, so that they could point downwards during VTOL or to the rear for supersonic flight. Another early jet-lit warplane was built by Dassault in France. Based on the Mirage III supersonic fighter, the Balzac featured an enlarged fuselage accommodating eight RB-108 lift engines. None of these exciting aircraft was to lead to anything. In contrast, the simplest type of jet VTOL aircraft possible, with only a single engine and nothing extra in the cockpit except a control lever and indicator for the pivoting nozzles, has gradually revolutionized tactical air warfare. Not only has it enabled air power to be based virtually anywhere, but it has even enabled a war to be won that could not otherwise have been fought at all. This small research model was one of the many that were tested in wind tunnels, and in this case, on a whirling arm. The problems were enormous, and many had never been met before. When the rear jet nozzles were angled down under the tail, it was expected that the tailplane would be thrust violently down, pitching up the nose uncontrollably. Models eventually showed this fear was groundless. This whirling arm rig was used to investigate the rapid accelerating and decelerating transitions. This Pioneer VTOL was the Hawker P1127. Nothing like it had ever been seen before. For the first time ever, here was an aircraft powered by a single jet engine which could rise off the ground vertically with its fuselage in the normal horizontal attitude and accelerate forwards under perfect control to jet fighter speeds. This prototype was a later P1127 called a Kestrel, first flown in March 1964. This was three and a half years after the first tentative tethered hover of the first P-1127. With its unusual landing gear retracted, the Kestrel could do most of the things a 1950s jet fighter could do. It could also slow to a standstill, hover in mid-air if necessary, and finally make a feather-light vertical landing. A fast pass at the Farnborough Air Show by two Kestrels and a Hunter served to show that the little Kestrel despite all the penalties of being able to hover, could beat the conventional hunter in speed, range, and rate of climb. The key to all this was the amazing Pegasus engine, pioneered by Bristol Sidley, which became part of Rolls-Royce in 1966. For the first time, an otherwise normal turbofan engine had four nozzles. There was one on each side at the front for the air from the fan, and one on each side to the rear for the hot gases from the jet. The nozzles are not actually part of the engine, but part of the aircraft. This leaves the basic engine extremely compact, though very powerful, generating a thrust of about 21,500 pounds. It is only about eight feet long. The Pegasus engine is installed by lowering it into the fuselage from above. It is then coupled up to the four nozzles. These nozzles are arranged two in front of the aircraft center of gravity and two behind, so that the thrust lifts the aircraft straight up without tipping it up on its nose or down on its tail. To evaluate the performance of the unique Pegasus engine, special ground test beds were built at Bristol. Engine efflux is led away out of the building by twin ducts. The test engine is mounted on a cradle high inside the building. The test bed was designed from the start to simultaneously measure both vertical and horizontal thrust. It was also versatile, able to accommodate future vectored thrust or vertical lift engines. On this alternative outdoor test bed, the engine is started and then the nozzles are rotated not downwards but upwards so that the four jets do not blast straight onto the ground as they would in the aircraft. The pilot or the operator on the test bed has just a single lever to control the nozzles.
twin compressed air powered motors drive through shafts and strong chains to rotate all four nozzles in exact unison. They can move through their full range of 99 degrees in one second. The four nozzles have to work together without fail because they are every bit as vital as the wing is to the ordinary aircraft. For a VTO, vertical takeoff, during taxiing and running up of the engines, the nozzles are kept in the horizontal position to avoid ground erosion and ingestion of debris. As the throttle is open to full power, the nozzles are turned downwards and the aircraft lifts vertically. To transition into forward flight, the nozzles are gradually rotated backwards. The aircraft accelerates forward and reaches normal wingborne flight speed. The big engine inlets have generous rounded lips and work well at low speed. training, pilots would make many VTOs, then transition forwards into wingborne flight. With the nozzles vectored to the 75 degree position, the four jets still give 96% of the maximum vertical lift, but they also give a 25% horizontal component, which is enough for forward acceleration. All this can be done with the fuselage almost level. In the mid-1960s, P-1127s and Kestrels made hundreds of VTOs under all conditions, some from rain-sodden runways and others from grass or even desert. It was realized from the start that as an alternative to VTO, the pilot can make an STO, short takeoff. The engine is opened up with the nozzles pointing aft. This causes tremendous forward acceleration without any ground erosion. At a suitable speed, the pilot flicks the nozzles down to 55 degrees and the aircraft leaps off the ground, lifted partly by the small wing and partly by the jets. The aircraft continues to accelerate. An STO enables the aircraft to get off with a much heavier load of fuel and weapons. And by 1964, it was realized that the usual operational method would be Stovall, short takeoff, vertical landing. In between, pilots would make fast passes at maybe 600 knots before coming back to hover. Then at very low level, they would practice using the puffer jet reaction controls of the wingtips, nose and tail. Fed with highly compressed air from the engine, these high power jets enable the pilot to pitch, roll, pirouette, or just hold the aircraft over a fixed point, even in a strong wind. When the pilot's control stick is centered, the puffer jets are shut off. Of course, as one of the key advantages of VTOL or Stovell is that the aircraft can fly from any spot of reasonably level ground, a lot of the early trials involved rough strips, though the main development flying was done from Hawker's airfield at Dunsfold. One of the early problems was directional stability in hovering flight because the huge airflow into the engine inlets overcame the natural weathercock stability. Pilots could often be seen making 360 degree turns, exploring the handling.
These early P-1127s needed constant attention, or, for example, it was possible to come back to Earth just a little too hard. Hardly surprising, because this was a new challenge entirely. The P-1127 was the right flyer of Jet VTOL. To find out some of the problems, in 1963, Britain, the USA, and the Federal Republic of Germany decided to fund a tripartite squadron. Each nation paid for three of the improved P-1127s called Kestrels. And in 1964, the squadron got into business with pilots from the RAF, US Army, Navy, and Air Force, and the Luftwaffe. For the first time in history, these combat pilots had to be fully trained on fast jets and on helicopters. But even this did not prepare them fully for the problems of operating transonic jet lift aircraft that could hide in woods and take off from any place a jeep could go 40 miles an hour. All pilots found VTO easy, though this often caused ground erosion problems. Everyone enjoyed the accelerating transition followed by a fast, low-level pass. The nine kestrels were painted with strange roundels and fin flashes incorporating the national markings of the three countries. But the aircraft were still right flyers. They carried nothing but a simple gun sight and a camera in the nose, though in theory they could be fitted with two underwing pylons. Most of the flying was carried out from RAF West Raynham in Norfolk and from the surrounding countryside. As well as the pilots, multinational ground crews were responsible for the servicing of the aircraft. Much experience was gained in taxiing and in rolling takeoffs from paved and rough strips. made using various kinds of surface protection, such as metal planks or discs, flexible sheets, and even bright pink fiberglass sprayed on soil or grass. The squadron also investigated rough field rolling landings, which eliminated the problem of ground erosion and re-ingestion of hot gas or debris into the engine. Often the squadron operated as a unit. And of course, in theory, it was possible to fire the engine starter cartridges and then, seconds later, go straight up. In practice, it was soon found that the best operating technique was Stovell. And this has been the preferred method ever since. At the end of nine months, 938 sorties had been flown, and there seemed little more to learn with these primitive machines. Six went to the USA, where they were called XV-6As. They flew sporadically from Edwards, Patuxent River, and Fort Campbell. However, the basic lack of American interest in Stovall aircraft relegated them to the status of curiosities.
In Britain, there was a more realistic appreciation of what might happen in any future war. Back in 1963, a P-1127 had flown from the big carrier Ark Royal, and in June 1966, a Kestrel carried out more serious trials from the smaller carrier HMS Bulwark. These trials were integrated with the flying of Wessex helicopters. At the start, it was established that the guidance directions of a batsman were unnecessary. Numerous BTOs were made with the ship underway, and it was also found possible to hover in the lee of the island in a region subjected to considerable turbulence. VLs were made off various kinds of approach. The standard helicopter approach involves coming in astern off the port side and then translating across sideways to reach the deck. This was soon found to be unnecessarily difficult and the jet pilots much preferred a simple straight in approach from astern. By 1966, the government had at last decided that manned combat aircraft might again be permitted, contrary to an amazing decree in 1957. So the P-1127 and Kestrel were at last able to develop into the Harrier. This was a complete redesign, though at first glance, it did not look very different. One of the early Harrier GR-1 aircraft, GR meaning ground attack and reconnaissance, carried out a remarkable series of trials, flying from the tiny helicopter pad at the stern of the cruiser Blake. Not only was the pad a far smaller area than any jet lift aircraft had ever operated from before, but the ship at times was rolling 12 degrees and the wind gusting at 35 knots. Another problem was that the small platform was downwind of a large superstructure which normally housed the ship's helicopters and the air officer's control position. This caused severe turbulence. From here, obviously, every takeoff had to be a VTO, and every landing, a VL. But the entire program of flying went off perfectly. bitten ship's crew were quite impressed. When the Harrier was at last ordered for the RAF, it was expected that they would often operate from the two remaining Royal Navy fleet carriers, Ark Royal and Eagle. In March 1970, two Harrier GR-1s of the RAF conducted extended trials from HMS Eagle. By this time, it was known that Harriers could operate from ships, but these tests were aimed at proving that genuine combat missions could be flown. As the trials proceeded, the takeoff weight of the Harriers was progressively increased. All takeoffs were of the free rolling type, with no need for the ship's catapult. Fuel tanks, rocket pods, and inert bombs were hung on the aircraft and some of the stores, including the bombs, were jettisoned in practice runs before aircraft recovery. 
Many VLs were made with the ship steaming at full speed. The trials also included topside servicing of the aircraft, the use of the elevators, and simulated maintenance in the hangar. As a result of these trials, the RAF was cleared to operate its GR-1s from carriers. This was the first time such a clearance had ever been issued to an Air Force unit. In the following year, 1971, Number One Squadron took its Harriers aboard Ark Royal. None of the RAF pilots had ever flown from a ship before. Unlike other jet lift aircraft, all of the Harrier family have only one unfamiliar feature, a nozzle selector lever in the simple cockpit. There is a single curved box from which protrude two levers. One is the throttle, the other is the nozzle lever, which is telescopic and spring-loaded and controls the angle of the nozzles. Normally, the pilot can move it anywhere he wants without ever having to look down. For forward acceleration, the nozzle selector lever is slammed forward along with the throttle. For short takeoff, the speed is preset and the lever is moved to a preset stop, typically at 50 or 55 degrees. For VTO, or hover, it is pulled back to the vertical at a fixed stop. For braking, in air combat or for deceleration before landing, the lever is lifted over the VTO stop into the braking sector. Usually the pilot will go straight to maximum braking. The pilot could vector the nozzles during air-to-air -air refueling, but normally uses just throttle and air brake. Right from the start of services in early 1969, RAF Harrier GR-1 squadrons practiced refueling from Victor K-1A tankers. Nobody then suspected how crucial this would be 13 years later to enable Harriers to fly sectors of 4,500 miles and go straight into battle. In 1961, Hawker aircraft were told to produce a P-1127 two-seat trainer. This was then canceled. But in 1965, a two-seat Harrier was called for and produced. The first Harrier T4 flew in April 1969. Much longer than the single-seater and with a bigger tail, the T4 has full combat capability. It then exploded the myth that only experienced frontline pilots could fly Harriers. Of course, with a jet-lift aircraft, it would be lunacy to allow it anywhere near an airfield in wartime. This would invite destruction. But at times, Harriers have demonstrated how easily they can take off from cratered runways. Obvious deployment is into the countryside, particularly to wooded areas. Appropriately, the first Harrier squadron was the RAF's number one, whose motto is, first in everything. They soon explored dispersed operations from wooded areas using various weapons. But in March 1970, the squadron flew out to RAF Akrotiri in Cyprus. No need to hide here. It was an armament practice camp. Many sorties were flown using live ordnance. 
cluster bomb dispensers, rockets, and 30 millimeter cannon were all used effectively. The tiny Harrier was found to pack a punch and to have many unexpected assets, such as agility and near invisibility. By 1971, Harriers were serving with the first squadron of the US Marine Corps. Designated AV-8A, the aircraft were even simpler than those of the RAF, but they carried the AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missile. This enabled the AV-8A to fly rapid reaction air defense missions, though of course only under day visual conditions. During tests, an AV-8A formated behind a USAF KC-135 in order to fly through a dense spray of water. This test, similar to one previously carried out in England with an RAF Harrier, was to check proper operation of the engine and airframe in heavy rain or severe icing conditions. Like other Harriers, the Marine Corps' AV-8As can have a bolt-on in-flight refueling probe. This enables the aircraft to make long ferrying flights refueled by such tankers as the KC-130, KA-6D, or A-4 with a buddy pack. The AV-8As also routinely operated from ships, such as the U.S. Navy assault vessel Raleigh. The Marine AV-8As also operated from the much bigger Tarawa class of amphibious warfare transports. Unlike all other fast jets, the Harriers do not need a large deck. One Harrier, assembled from parts freely donated by the suppliers and with appropriate registration VTOL, is the British Aerospace Demonstrator. One of the users of the AV-8A is Spain's Naval Aviation. Their aircraft are called VA-1 Matadors, the trainer being the VAE-1. The Matadors equip Squadron 008, based at Rota, and are also embarked in Spain's two carriers. A distinctive feature of the Matador is the large radio antenna on top of the fuselage. This enables the pilots to talk to surface vessels and helicopters. Spain operates 11 single-seat Matadors and a pair of two-seat trainer versions. Cancellation of the Hawker P-1154 jet lift aircraft, a supersonic big brother to the Harrier, left the Royal Navy with no fixed wing air power, except the massive Phantom FG-1, which needs a long takeoff run. It cannot operate at sea, except from huge carriers. But the British government canceled these in 1966, incomprehensibly saying that sea-going air power could somehow be left to the RAF alone the Royal Navy was to have no fixed-wing fighters or ground attack aircraft of its own. But the ability of the Harrier to land on tiny decks opened up a whole new concept of seagoing air power. The result is the Sea Harrier. This is a Harrier with a new front end, containing a multi-mode radar, 
new cockpit, and other features. Its designation is FRS-1, meaning Fighter, Reconnaissance, and Strike. It's the world's most versatile combat aircraft. It needs no airfield or conventional aircraft carrier, but its performance is enhanced by the ski jump launching ramp. Ski jump ramps were first tested ashore on an airfield. The ramps curve upwards at up to 12 degrees. They increase safety and enable 2,500 pounds more war load to be carried for the same short run. Alternatively, the run can be reduced by 60% at a fixed weight. Trials with two-seaters and with sea harriers began in 1977. Though ski jump ramps were not thought of when the ships were designed, the Royal Navy's three Invincible class vessels were all fitted with them. HMS Ark Royal has her ramp set to the optimum angle, though her sister ships, Invincible and Illustrious, have their ramps set at only seven degrees. Sea Harriers can carry 5,000 pounds of weapons on five stations. The FRS-1's air combat weapons are Sidewinder missiles and two 30-millimeter cannons. Fully laden Sea Harriers are launched with no catapult and are recovered with no arrestor wires. The two 30 mm Aden cannon are carried in separate pods below the fuselage. Here, additional fuel tanks are fitted to the inner wing hard points. The Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles are carried on the outer wing pylons. After being updated as Sea Harrier FRS-2s, they will carry the big Sea Eagle anti-ship missile with a range of at least 70 miles. Propelled by a small turbojet, Sea Eagle has an active radar in its nose which enables it to find and hit its target in any weather, skimming the waves at near the speed of sound. Sea Eagle can cripple any warship except the biggest carriers. Another Sea Harrier weapon is the two-inch rocket, smaller than that fired by the RAF, but salvoed in larger numbers, 36 from each launcher. These high-velocity rockets were also fired from RAF Harrier GR-3s during the Falklands campaign and were found highly effective. Rippling away 72 of them gives several seconds of virtually continuous firepower with high accuracy. Sea Harriers frequently practice firing two-inch rockets against towed splash targets. Sea Harriers also frequently practice with simulated or real sidewinder firings. The current short-medium range air-to-air -air sidewinder can knock down targets at out to eight miles. Sea Harriers can carry out toss bombing or horizontal laydown bombing. Another Harrier weapon is the BL-755 cluster bomblet dispenser, 
which was also used effectively during the Falklands campaign by sea harriers and RAF harriers. In 1988, the first upgraded Sea Harrier FRS-2s appeared. Distinguished by its larger and much more powerful Blue Vixen radar, which will replace the current Blue Fox radar, it will have full look-down and shoot-down capability using the new American AIM-120A AMRAAM missile. The FRS-2 also has a longer rear fuselage and is totally revised internally to have far greater mission effectiveness especially in bad weather or conditions of hostile countermeasures. Basically, the FRS-2 is still the same size as the FRS-1, the smallest combat aircraft in the modern world. This compact size belies the Sea Harrier's versatility and proven combat effectiveness. In the Falklands campaign, they scored at least 23 nil and possibly 28 nil in air combat whilst operating in what were often atrocious blizzard conditions. The first overseas customer for the Sea Harrier was India, which has placed a series of repeat orders for single-seat Mark 51s and two-seat Mark 60s. Navy squadrons operate from the carriers Vikrant and Vira. Another possible customer is Italy. While the British aerospace demonstrator has been seen aboard a carrier of the French Navy, though the only sea harriers actually exported so far have gone to India. In the RAF, the GR1 harriers of 1969 were long ago upgraded in engine power and fitted with thimble noses containing laser rangers and marked target seekers. The result? is the GR3, the training unit for which is number 233 operational conversion unit. All RAF Harrier pilots have to be proficient with the SNEB 68mm rocket. This high velocity weapon has been proved effective against all but the heaviest frontal armor of modern battle tanks. Out on the ranges, GR3 pilots consistently get good scores with these unguided weapons, using the inertial platform laser ranger weapon aiming computer and head-up display.
Turn round back at RAF Wittering, dubbed the home of the Harrier, is fast and efficient. The aircraft may have to be refueled and rearmed, ready for another sortie. The SNEB rockets are fired through the aerodynamic cowling on the front of the pods and have to be replaced after each mission. There is no substitute for actual practice with actual weapons. In April 1982, all hell was let loose by the Argentine invasion of the Falklands. With amazing haste, the British government organized Operation Corporate to recover the islands. The new light carrier Invincible and the much bigger Hermes sailed from Portsmouth with all available sea harriers. They went out to do battle with 10 times as many Skyhawks, Mirages, Daggers and other aircraft. The Sea Harrier roundels were repainted as the low visibility B type with no white area. The aircraft were given a dull gray finish. Later, a lighter color called barley gray was adopted. Full battle maintenance was conducted on the hangar decks. Every aircraft had to be ready for service. The ships were loaded with bombs, BL 755 dispensers, rockets, tanks and for escort and interception duties, sidewinders. Pre-flight inspection by the pilots about to go into action for the first time took on a new significance. The first operations were flown from about 90 miles east of the islands. The very first combat mission was a bombing and strafing attack on Stanley Airfield at dawn on May the 1st. Intenso. Viewed from Port Stanley, the Harriers encountered heavy fire from guns of all calibers and from Roland and Tiger Cat surface-to-air missiles. The target airfield across the bay received several hits. This operation, the first of 2,197 sorties flown by an eventual total of 28 aircraft, ended with all Sea Harriers returning safely. Each aircraft came in diagonally over the left side and put down on its deck spot. Often this had to be done in virtually zero visibility.
Just one Sea Harrier took a hit from a small caliber shell in its fin. It was flying next day. A night attack by a lone RAF Vulcan in what was by far the longest bombing mission in history put one bomb in the middle of the runway, rendering it unusable by large numbers of Argentine jets. The subsequent Sea Harrier strike put the occupying forces totally on the defensive and caused great damage, both physical and to Argentine morale. Later, the RAF joined in with GR-3s, and today the RAF is equipping squadrons with a totally new second-generation Harrier II. This is known to the RAF as the GR-5, and when further upgraded with night and all-weather equipment, it will be the GR-7. This GR-5 on test shows the marvelous long-span wing. Made by McDonnell Douglas in carbon fiber, it holds one and a half times as much fuel as in the earlier Harriers. It also provides for no fewer than 11 weapon stations, including four under each wing. A GR-5 is here carrying BL-755 cluster bomblet dispensers, yet is nowhere near the weight limit of 9,200 pounds. All the GR-5's weapon trials were most successful, and like the US Marine Corps' AV-8B version, with a range of weapon load twice that of the original Harrier, flying this aircraft is a totally new experience for the pilots. It all stemmed from this YAV-8B prototype, flown at St. Louis in November 1978. Modified from an earlier Harrier, the YAV-8B introduced the new high-lift wing and many other changes, all based on deeper understanding of jet stowball, gained in 10 years of Harrier combat duty. Sadly, the British government's decision not to collaborate meant that control of the program passed to the United States, and British aerospace became a minor participant with 40% of the airframe and 25% of the assembly work. Moreover, it also meant that the RAF's Harrier II version was not absolutely designed for its own requirements. With US government policy and funding to run a proper program, McDonnell Douglas also created a completely new trainer version, the TAV-8B. A production TAV-8B visited England in 1988, though normally they are seen only at Cherry Point, North Carolina. The new trainer, with deeply stepped tandem cockpits, has the same mean, purposeful look as the single-seat Harrier IIs. The cockpit is totally new compared with the 1960s vintage Harriers. RAF versions have thicker canopy moldings because of the frequency of bird strikes at full throttle at low level over Britain and Germany. One of the new features of all Harrier IIs is the longer design of front engine nozzle, giving more thrust. The new outrigger landing gears are only halfway to the wingtips, instead of being at the tips. RAF GR5s have these outrigger gear fairings extended forward to provide extra pylons for sidewinders. Compared with earlier Harriers, the view from the AV-8B and TAV-8B is superb the canopy being bulged outwards and the windscreen being frameless. U.S. Marine Corps aircraft such as this TAV-8B have stencil ejection seats, while the RAF GR-5s have the new Martin Baker Mark 12 seat. The TAV has a longer vertical tail and it can carry most of the weapons carried by the single-seaters. AV-8Bs entered Marine Corps' service in October 1983, more than five years ahead of regular squadron service by the GR-5. The Marines have a requirement for 300 AV-8Bs plus 28 trainers, with more than half of the total delivered by late 1988. 
A further 12 aircraft, styled EAV-8B, have been delivered to the Spanish Navy. And eventually, the RAF will receive 96 GR-5s and GR-7s, making a total for the Harrier II of 436. The basic missions of the Marines are to support beach assaults. In support of amphibious operations, various forms of dive attack or lay-down bombing are practiced, together with rocket firing and strafing with guns. Operations are routinely mounted from ships of the U.S. Navy. To support operations inland, AV-8Bs work from hides on land, if possible in wooded areas. There are plenty of these in North Carolina, where most of the training has been centered. The smaller track between the outrigger gears makes it easier to taxi on narrow paths, and operations at up to the maximum of 31,000 pounds have been flown from dirt roads, though here a paved highway is being used to keep down flying debris and dust. Rolling vertical landings carry the aircraft ahead of any debris that in a completely vertical landing might be ingested by the engine. Back in Britain, Sea Harriers of the Royal Navy's No. 899 Squadron often polish their display routines. Even today, 20 years after it entered service and nearly 30 years after the first hover of the P-1127, the Harrier is a surefire showstopper, which usually generates spontaneous applause. If only the generals and politicians knew, this tiny airplane is the only one in the West that we can count on having on day two of any future war. And what other aircraft capable of Mach 1.3 can finish its show by bowing to the audience?